Welcome to this week's Musicians on Call with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Today we'd like to share with you some wonderful tunes from all around Europe. And we're going to start with Hetty, and then we're going to hear how the same piece can sound completely different on another instrument. Hello again, my name is Hetty and I'm a violinist with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. A couple of weeks ago, I played you a few dance tunes from the 16th century. And today I've chosen another very ancient tune. It's a Northumbrian folk song called John Come Kiss Me Now, and it became very popular with tavern fiddlers. There's a lovely 17th century diarist's description of many a lord of the manor hiring half a dozen folk fiddlers to come and scrape through John Come Kiss Me Now. But today I'm going to play you a version where folk meets the court. It's by a composer called Thomas Baltzar, um, originally a North German composer. He emigrated to Britain in the mid 1600s and astonished all the aristocracy with his virtuosity. Nobody had heard a violinist who could play so fast, his fingers moved so quickly, and they'd never heard someone play violin so sweetly or they were totally astonished by the way that he could play more than one note at a time, play chords, double stopping, and make it sound as though he were playing many instruments with just one violin. And the other thing that amazed them was the how he could play high up on his fingerboard. They couldn't work out how he got up there or even how he got back down again. So he was very quickly snapped up by the king, King Charles II, and made master of the, of the king's private music and he was given a huge salary which he rather squandered by drinking heavily and dying in his mid-thirties. Anyway, here are the variations. You hear the tunes very simply to begin with and then um, a nice high descant and after that he divides the beat into faster and faster notes. It was called divisions at the time and towards the end there's a rather wistful um, variation where you can hear his Balzar's famous double stopping and then there's a sprint to the end and I'd like to leave you with an image which has really tickled me it's a, about a night out in 1665 where the king King Charles II and the Spanish ambassador and a handful of others having thrown away their wigs, came out leaping and dancing into the moonlight, preceded by a whole band of violins. And I like to think these violins might have been playing John Come Kiss Me Now. Thank you. 
Hi, my name's Chris and I play the harpsichord for the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment and I'm here to introduce you to my beautiful little Italian harpsichord which is a copy of an instrument built in Italy in about 1600 um, and I can play a really wide variety of repertoire on it. So I play music from the beginning of the 16th century by music by people like Frescobaldi. And I can play music from the end of the 17th century by um, English composers perhaps, Pen Henry Purcell. And music going into the middle of the 18th century, Bach. And also Handel. Hetty's just played you one version of John Come Kiss and I'm going to play you another, this time by the 16th century English composer William Byrd. outside to hear Andy playing another new instrument for the series and also to see Joe playing some lovely lilting folk tunes in the woods. One thing I've really enjoyed as players have been sending us in clips that they've been recording is that often when they're outside when they finish you just hear somebody clapping in the distance 
and I do hope that there are lots of people who are enjoying these musical treats as they go out for their daily exercise. Hello, I'm Andy and uh, you met me last week. I was playing the bagpipes and uh, the dulcian or kirtle. Uh, and uh, this week I'm playing an instrument that's much smaller. It's so small it can fit into my back pocket and it's a tin whistle. Uh, whistles are one of the oldest instruments, go back hundreds of years. Uh, but the modern tin whistle manufactured uh, in factories was uh, appearing from around the 1840s onwards. Well it's a nice day, it's May and uh, so I'm going to play an English country dance tune called The Month of May. And the next tune I'm going to play uh, comes from a collection made in the late 18th century, about 1775, in Scotland, and uh, it's called uh, an English and um, a, a collection of English, Scottish, and Irish airs. Uh, this tune's got a lovely title. It's called "Come Ashore, Jolly Tar, with Your Trousers On." Hope you enjoyed those tunes and uh, see you again sometime. Bye bye.
OE players are ever inventive and next we're going to have a story from Nicola and Ellen telling us all about a composer who lived in Italy and travelled to London just as Nicola himself has done. Once upon a time, in the south of Italy, there lived a little boy called Nicola. From a young age, he loved to play the violin and soon became one of the most virtuosic violinists of his generation. He travelled to London, where he found fame, and he published his book of airs for the violin. Nicola, would you like to give us an example? Like in every story, most of the things are true. Um, some of the things are imagination. The only things we are sure about is the music we are going to play for you to tell you this story of Nicola Matteis. And that this Nicola definitely doesn't play the violin. But I'm actually Ellen's flatmate and I've done probably quite the same travel as Nicola Matteis, just hundred, a couple of hundred years after him. And we don't know much about the travel from Naples to London about Nicola Matteis because most of the documents are, in, are not survived. Uh, but we know about him when he was already in London. We have a lot of records of um, his life from diaries of people that have been to his fabulous concerts. And he was famous to be, yes, an incredible violinist, but also quite a moody and rude person sometimes. And this probably reflects uh, is the mood of his music, which goes from the youth um, memories of the tarantella you've just heard uh, to the melancholic hair that he wrote and put in his first book of airs for violin. When he arrived in London, um, apparently he got married and also bought a house in Norfolk. So he was definitely in contact with the 
local tradition and also the uh, local musical tradition. Um, it was also famous and named for being able to melt very well the Italian violin school with the French violin school, which was very popular at the time in England. And, and among these things, he was definitely put some of his folk memories from the past and from his present. And we are quite sure that he, he might have heard the marching band, for example, playing one of the tunes uh, that Playford, uh, years before, as collecting in his dancing master. And this is the Lily Bolero. someone singing on the street, uh, an old song again from the play for Dancing Master. Folk um, tradition of the British Isles has always been uh, a good inspiration for any sort of musician or composers that end up to live um, on those islands. And that's the case before Nicola Matteis arrived with Playford Dancing Master uh, collection uh, that we had played just before, and uh, with many other Italian colleagues of Nicola Matteis that arrived after him. Uh, I'm sure you remember Gemignani, but there is another one we want to remember today, which is Barzanti, uh, which was from another Italian town, uh, Lucca, and he ended up first in London and then in Edinburgh and published in 1742 a collection of Scott tunes. And we have just chosen two of these to give the flavor uh, of the folk tradition just a bit ahead uh, Matei's time. <laughs> Thank you. 
unfortunately, our story uh, might have a sad ending if we consider it the way that most of the artists were dying at the time, like in poverty and forgotten by most of, of their audience. But in the case of Nicola Matteis, I think it's even more important to remember how famous he was and what people were saying about him, uh, quoting something from, let's say, a diary, a review of a concert of that time. So in 1674, John Evelyn wrote in his diary about Matthäus. He seemed to be spiritatoed and played such ravishing things on a ground as astonished us all. And probably Nicola Matthäus couldn't find a better way to combine the happiness of dancing and the happiness of drinking of the British Isles, uh, writing a ground on a Scotch humour. We've had some lovely comments so far on the series and please do keep sending them in to us. I'd also like to ask your help. Do you know anybody who likes some musical company who might be interested? And if so, let them know about the series. Tell them there's some music every Wednesday at four o'clock. We're going to finish today with a lively tarantella. I hope you might join in with tapping your feet, clapping your hands or beating a drum.